On this episode, we look at planning for the largest pedestrian event in Washington history, President Obama's inauguration. Thousands of cyclists took advantage of valet bicycle parking for the inauguration. Then we learn about Humana's bicycle sharing program in Louisville, Kentucky. Humana took their bicycle program to the Democratic and Republican National Conventions. Finally, we talk with a convention delegate who tried out the shared bicycles. Stay tuned. We're talking with Karen LeBlanc, who's Director of Communications for the District Department of Transportation, or DDOT. What issues were you concerned about planning for Inauguration Day? Well, specifically, we knew that we were expecting a lot of people. There was a lot of discussion back and forth about how many people, but we knew it would be certainly numbers far larger than we had ever seen before. So we were concerned about how we were going to safely move those people in and around the city, particularly down near the mall area. And so um, that was probably our number one top priority was the safety of those people coming to visit. And how many different uh, or groups and organizations are involved in in planning for the inauguration. I have to tell you that was one of the best parts about working on this entire day and the event was the camaraderie and the partnerships that we had with both the federal and the district agencies. Um, we, I worked directly with, uh, for as far as communication and public affairs work went, we worked directly with the Secret Service and the Capitol Park Police and the Metropolitan Police Department and, uh, and everybody, just any federal agency or district agency that you could think of was involved in that. Just from minor roles to larger roles, it was, it was really a wonderful effort. It took a lot of meetings, lots and lots of meetings. Okay, and all these folks got together in endless meetings. Uh, what solutions did you come up with, how you deal with that many people? Well, there were a number of factors, again, that were playing into this. One, again, was the crowds. Uh, the second was how the crowds were going to get here and what type of transportation they were going to take. So we, we wanted there to be alternative modes for people to take in. So we certainly had bike, which I know Waba was uh, an instigator, and we worked very closely with them in partnering on the bike valet, which was very successful. Uh, we had tour buses that we were concerned about coming in, and we had people who would be driving in in automobiles as well. And we had access points to get people in and out of the city, which for the bridges or some of the main roads that come into the city. So all of those things played into our concerns about how we were going to get people in and out of the city. And once we identified those, then we were able to kind of dissect our way through how we were going to work on each of those and then bring them together as a whole to get everybody into the city through one large transportation plan. And it was a regional effort. It wasn't just people in the district. We all certainly had to work very closely with our Maryland and Virginia partners as well and beyond. You know, we were talking to DOTs in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New York and Florida and Alabama, I mean, all over the United States basically and certainly um, uh, a large contingency on the East Coast. So people coming in uh, by transit, by bus, by car, on bike, on foot. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened when they all got here? Well, what we determined would be the best solution and, and certainly what our, our uh, city administrator and the people who were looking at the plans and redeveloping the plans and um, discussing the best solution would be to um, eliminate the the large amount of vehicles, uh, automobiles that we thought would be coming into the city because Originally, we had kind of looked at having the tour buses outside the city and the cars inside the city. But by reversing that, we brought more people in in a in a in a, capa in a bigger capacity. You know, in the buses, you can have 50 people as opposed to 50 cars, and then moving the cars to the outside and having them utilize the metro stations. And that seemed to be a plan that everybody agreed upon. So once we got there, uh, we identified what we thought were going to be the amount of tour buses coming into the city and how many people that would be. And then we also um, had an idea of how many people would be coming in from the metro. WMATA was another big player. They were another, you know, big component about uh, of who we coordinated with and partnering and getting those folks in. So once we identified those, then we started working on getting those messages out to the people who were planning on coming to the inauguration. We worked through the tour bus associations. We worked directly with um, 
again, our regional partners on getting uh, information out to the public, you know, various ways of getting that information out through the media to let people know what the plan was and how they should come into the city. And that plan included um, the tour buses, again, parking within the city limits, and we created designated parking areas for that to occur. And then the cars parking in the metro areas outside and taking metro in, and anybody else who was planning on attending to take metro as much as possible. And in addition to moving people around, there were security concerns on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the security concerns fit into the transportation concerns? Well, because it was a NSSE, which is a national security event, basically, um, they Secret Service takes the lead on a lot of this stuff, and so we we follow in their footsteps whatever they have to set as that security barrier. Then we're able to base our plans around that. So once they um, put together their soft and hard perimeters, which they put out publicly, then we were able to identify those areas and then we could work as to where we could place our people. And so it was just a well, it really was well coordinated. It just worked out really very well. And But it, all those components had to fit into place. Inside the security perimeters, uh, what was allowed? Uh, the not much. Um, the way the Secret Service had it set up and the uh, information they had put on their websites was basically just pedestrians. And if you had to come in in a vehicle, you had to be an authorized vehicle. And so there were two secure m secure areas, so to speak. There was the parade route, which had the um, the magatrons that you had to go through, and then there was the ticketed area up near the Capitol, where um, only if you had ticketed could you get in, and you had to again get through a magnetron. But the rest of the area was open to the public, so people could easily get access to the mall or that downtown area if they needed to. And did that work to your advantage, having the streets devoid of cars and all those pedestrians there? Absolutely, yes, without a doubt. I mean, certainly, I mean, it takes, you know, that factor away totally, and then we can focus more on moving people in and around that area without worrying about them getting, you know, blindsided or competing for space um, with the vehicles. So I think that that really made a big difference. And you had area north of the mall, area south of the mall, how how were pedestrians able to to get from the one side to the other? There were they could walk around, they could go various ways, and then we had also um, prohibited any vehicular traffic in the Third Street Tunnel. So there are two tunnels there. The one tunnel was for pedestrian traffic, which moved back and forth during the day. And the other was um, for vehicular emergency vehicles, so MPD or fire, EMS, or those type of vehicles could get through that tunnel. And you mentioned different jurisdictions working together. Uh, you have uh, several bridges connecting the district to Virginia. Uh, How did you handle the bridges on, on Inauguration Day? Well, the bridges were shut down. Um, basically, they, we kept them only open to authorized vehicles, the tour buses, of course, which had to come in to the city to park, and um, any, any type of you know, emergency vehicle that needed to get in, MPD, fire EMS, those type of vehicles that needed to get back and forth. And by limiting that, um, we again eliminated certain factors that would be competing factors, and then we were able to accommodate a lot more pedestrians and bicyclists on those bridges. Uh, in hindsight, there were quite a few people who ended up leaving the mall at one time, which impacted the bridges pretty strongly, and that's something we would look at as far as lessons learned for next time. Um, how do we, how do we uh, improve the pedestrian flow, the traffic flow across those bridges as folks were leaving the city? So how well did things go on Inauguration Day? Did, did things uh, work as you expected? Uh, we were very, very pleased with the feedback that we got from everybody. And that's really how we gauge how we did, was how did people respond to us? How did people, you know, when they called us, did they complain? When they called us, did they say you did a great job? And I, I, I would say, you know, 95% of the people that we talked with, that we had conversations with and debriefs afterwards and evaluations afterward were very, very pleased with how everything went. There's always room for improvement and there's always ways that you can uh, uh, look to um, change things so that it provides again for, for a, a, uh, a better environment or a safer environment for folks but we were very pleased with the way everything went and, and 
you know, we had more people, they estimated 1.8 million people that were here, and we had more people than we've ever had for any event. And, and the great thing about D.C. and the great thing that maybe people don't even realize is we do large events all the time. We have protests, we have people come in for parades, we have people come in for great events like, you know, uh, Susan G. Komen race. I mean, we have the National Marathon is here, so we have large crowds that come into the city. So in that sense, we were semi-prepared and had all the relationships in place. But to take on a crowd of that size, we were very proud of the way that it all worked out. We're talking with Eric Gilliland with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, or WABA. What is WABA? Uh, well, you got it right. The Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Uh, we're a local nonprofit uh, bike advocacy and education organization uh, that's dedicated to improving conditions for cyclists uh, throughout the D.C. area. What were you doing on Inauguration Day? Well, I was parking bikes and a whole lot of them. Uh, our association actually ran uh, two valley bike parking locations as part of the, uh, the inaugural celebrations. Uh, we had one at uh, 16th Street Northwest, just a, a couple blocks from the White House, uh, one near the Jefferson Memorial. And uh, we just parked over, we parked over 2,000 bikes that day, 2,040 by our, our best count. Uh, and it was just a fantastic hit. Uh, people loved it. Uh, we didn't lose a single bike. Uh, we actually we misplaced one helmet, but ended up finding it and getting it back to its owner. Uh, overall, it was just a fantastic day. Now, what what sort of planning went into doing something like this? You think, oh, you just set up a, a cage and a corral, and you know what's. What, how many people were involved in putting this together? Well, it was it was uh, a couple people on staff uh, that were mainly responsible. But I think what was great about it was that it was really embraced fully by the people who were doing the overall transportation plans for the inauguration itself. And so, uh, when you go to the inauguration website and you're thinking about you know how you might get down to to D.C. that day, biking was an option, just like uh, uh, transit or walking. Uh, or buses. So it was really uh, fully integrated into the overall transportation plan, which made it a lot more popular and made it our, our lives a bit easier. And the uh, two locations, the one on 16th Street near the White House, one down near the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, why those locations? Why why'd you, why'd you pick that, those? Well, uh, the Jefferson Memorial was a pretty obvious location. We've done uh, valets uh, there before for the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Uh, it's also uh, directly across uh, the Potomac from uh, on the, the 14th Street Bridge, so it's great access uh, to people coming from Virginia. Uh, 16th Street was a central location, more or less, uh, to capture people coming from Maryland and, and D.C. It offered pretty good access if you wanted to go to uh, the mall to see uh, the celebrations on the Jumbotrons or down to... Uh, the parade route, uh, and it was also a place where we can get a permit, so that, that was probably the biggest consideration. And downtown, you had a pretty wide area that was blocked off to, to motor vehicles. Um, what did that do for the bicycle experience? I thought it was fantastic. It was one of the best days to bike uh, around in D.C. from what I've heard. I've heard just so many stories about uh, people who were really panicking about uh, like how to get around that day. They chose their bikes. Uh, uh, a lot of them chose it because they knew that they had uh, valet bike parking there. Uh, and we provided uh, people with the information that they needed. We gave them uh, good routes to take, uh, all the safety information they wanted. Uh, and huge sections of the city were closed down to traffic. So it was actually an ideal uh, time to bike. It was a little cold, uh, but it wasn't too bad. And you know, people came out by the, by the thousands. I mean, your success could easily be measured by, you know, just the sheer number of bikes you parked. But what, what, what sort of feedback have you gotten back since then? What, uh, what the, uh, we, we got so much tremendous uh, positive feedback. Uh, we really went uh, all out with it. You know, thanks to America Bikes, which was one of our sponsors, and, and Darrow Racks, which provided uh, a lot of the racks for the parking, we were re really able to pull out all the stops. So we had commemorative spoke cards for everyone. Uh, we had uh, commemorative claim checks. We had uh, vests and, and bow ties for the volunteers and, and hot coffee and food for them as well. Uh, and people just loved it. Uh, it we it heard a lot of people, uh, both locally and, and from out of town, that said you know, they, they heard about it and wanted to bike uh, just to experience what it was like to, to park in a valet. So overall, we were very, very excited about how it all turned out. We're in Louisville, Kentucky, talking with Les McPherson with Humana. What do you do for Humana? Well, John, I'm with uh, Humana's Innovation Center. One of your innovations is called freewheeling. What's freewheeling? Well, John, we started freewheeling about a year and a half ago with our associates here in Louisville. 
And we just wanted to do something that was kind of new and fresh around health and wellness and that was environmentally sound and that promoted the spirit of activity and being fun. And so we launched a, a bike sharing program for our employees here in Louisville uh, in August of last year and just had been met with overwhelming su success. About 28% of our employees have signed up. Bikes were checked out on an average of five to seven times a day. And one, one of the things that was really neat was that of those associates that signed up, almost one in five were not involved in any sort of health or uh, exercise activity. So it was a great way to get them um, get them active as, as part of their lifestyle. Now, what sort of trips are people making on these bikes? Where are they going? It varies. Some are just riding up and down the street for meetings. Others are going out at lunch to um, just see the city and to get some exercise. And we also make the bikes available for people to take home overnight for commuting so they can take them home and bring them back the next day uh, as an alternative to driving. And do you feel that you've reduced uh, driving trips, either commuting or running errands during the day? Oh, we believe we've certainly had an impact on that. Um, we provided a, uh, an alternative to getting in the car, dealing with high gas prices, dealing with parking issues and those kinds of challenges, and um, just provided a, a neat way for our employees to get around town and do things that they normally would have driven. And given the fact that um, studies show that almost half of all car trips are three miles or less, the bikes is, uh, the bike is just a great substitute for a car. And how does the system work? An uh, employee that wants to take part and, and use the bikes, what, what are the logistics involved? It's very easy. Sign up online via our uh, internal website and we'll get them a, a, an access card and then they present that, check out a bike, and off they go. And then just uh, return the bike back within um, you know, 24 hours and they're good to go. And you've been doing this a year and a half. Uh, what have you learned so far that uh, you can do to make it bigger and better? Well, we've learned that the country in general, and Louisville in particular, is ready to embrace bike sharing with uh, the troubles of the economy, with a uh, high price of gas, and with continued emphasis around healthy, act, healthy lifestyles, activity, and, and green, green opportunities, that people are ready to embrace this. And you know, we see people that are getting on bikes that haven't been on bikes since they were kids get over that initial apprehension of doing it and off they go with a smile on their face. And one of your employees who hasn't ridden in a while that uh, uh, you might not feel that safe biking in the street, uh, what resources are available to, for them to get a little bit of you know, adult bike education? We think that's an important part of it around awareness and education because as you say, um, most many of us haven't ridden a bike since we were kids so jumping on a bike and riding out in, in the street navigating cars is not um, not something that you know they deal with every day so we provide some education and awareness basic hand signals right rights of way rules of the road um, so that they know how to safely navigate traffic know where bike paths and bike lanes are so that they can get to their destination as safely as possible mm. Other companies in Louisville or elsewhere, they see your employees running around on these bikes. Uh, have, have other people expressed an interest in, in learning from what you've done to do something similar for, for their employees? They certainly have. Uh, again, with, with the times of the economic times that we're in, high price of gasoline, uh, especially in the urban setting for urban transportation, uh, it's just an overwhelming response that. Uh, for the movement that's been in Europe for several years now, you know, American cities of, of any size are really embracing this as an opportunity. So we're trying to, through our advocacy organization, trying to work through uh, and help them understand what resources are at their disposal, how they can go about doing this in their cities. We're talking with Tony Tomasek with Humana. What do you do for Humana? I'm an innovation director with the Innovation Center. What does the Innovation Center do? We actually pilot new ideas and programs that might become businesses that would be standing alone businesses that would help to facilitate health and wellness in the community. And you've got your freewheeling bicycle program here for your employees. Uh, 
what have you done to show it off elsewhere in the country? Well, that's, that's a great question because that's really very close to our, our core functionality. Uh, we took the free willing program, which was focused primarily on our associates, and we were able to bring that to the Democratic and Republican national conventions this year by bringing a thousand bikes to each one of the conventions and allowing those bikes to be ridden for free by everybody at the conventions, and it was tremendously successful. So, you know, when you go to the uh, DNC and the RNC and say, we want to provide bikes for you for free, right. what, what sort of reaction did you get? Well, it, people really ask, you know, what is this going to cost? So you're renting bikes, you know, how much is this really going to cost me? The fact is, all you needed was an ID card, a credit card to make sure that you didn't ride the bike off into the sunset. And when we told people you could take it at 7 a.m. and keep it until 7 p.m., they were just thrilled. So they started riding these bikes. The real experience, I think, for them was bringing the bikes back after they'd had a chance to go get a cup of coffee in the morning or take lunch with their friends. When they coasted back into a station, climbed off of a bike, returned it to one of our bike valets, and that was it. They said, we hope you enjoyed the ride, come on back. The, the grins that were on their faces as a result of that were just fantastic. And the statistics that we had really spoke to how people responded. The, the results were absolutely phenomenal and we had to replicate the process, that same experience for our own people here in Louisville as well. So late in September after we finished up with the RNC, we came back here and we actually did it for the Idea Festival for Louisville. And you had uh, you know political leaders from all over the country oh, yeah. riding a bike, perhaps for the first time in, sure. in a number of years. Um, what lessons do you think they're taking home with them? Well, I, I tell you what, we had fantastic response. So certainly there were a lot of government uh, elected officials who rode the bikes. We had celebrities, we had um, some famous people, uh, Daryl Hannah and Matthew Modine stopped by one of our stations. Um, uh, fabulous response. But since we were tracking the actual IDs of the folks that were riding these bikes, we knew where they were coming from. We had representatives from all 50 states. We had something like 32 countries all represented uh, from our ridership. But it was the city residents themselves that really turned out and put the miles on these bikes. In the DNC, it was Denver people. The people who live there actually came down from their apartments and from their homes. They got off their commuter buses and their trains and they got on these bikes and they used them in their community. Same thing was true within Minneapolis and in Louisville as well when we did it for the Idea Festival. I think what they wound up doing was re-experiencing or maybe relearning what it's like to ride a bike. It's not hard at all. It's not difficult to integrate that into your lifestyle. It's really convenient and it is pretty fun. And it's everything you remembered it was when you were 13 and 14. You can rediscover that as an adult. And if you make it easy, people just naturally gravitate to it. And I, I can see people wanting to you know, emulate this at you know, maybe in four years at the next conventions or at other major events in between. But you say it was mostly the local people that were using this. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that tell cities about the potential for setting this up on a permanent basis? Well, we, we certainly hope it tells them an awful lot. And one of the things that we learned about this program was that communities really are hungry for this kind of a solution. Uh, it justified us getting involved in and helping to sponsor a standalone business of bike sharing. And the system that you see really over my shoulder here represents an evolution of that technology where people can participate in a bike sharing system by having a membership in it, access a bike, use it as they need to during the day, and check it in at another station across town. And we think that is going to be really special to help to enhance not just ridership, but also to facilitate health and an attitude about green and the environment. We're talking with Maryland State Senator Jamie Raskin. Why were you in Denver last August? Well, I was a delegate to the convention for Obama and chaired the Obama campaign in Montgomery County. So it was a very exciting time. And um, the Democratic convention in 2008 was one of the absolute highlight experiences of my life, um, where the speeches were incredible, the spirit was amazing, the solidarity and the the union of the Obama and Hillary people it was just an incredible time. There was one major problem, which is that the city did not seem to be very well set up for the transportation logistics required of a great national political convention. And we were constantly stuck in traffic if we were in a taxi or on a bus or a van. Um, the vans and buses were constantly late. People were getting uh, left at hotels, stuck at places at one o'clock in the morning, and so on. And then people began to realize that there were these bicycle uh, sites that were set up all over the city, 
and we started riding bikes every place. And it was a huge liberation, and it was really the only thing that made the convention work, that uh, a significant percentage of the delegates and alternates and guests began to use bicycles. And it was really by far the best way to, uh, you know, to get around the city. Do you think there were some folks riding bikes that hadn't been on one in a few years? Well, I was one of them. I'm not like, you know, a big recreational bike rider uh, and prefer public transit or, uh, you know, I admit shamefully driving my car. But, um, you know, the the bike was really the right way to go when you were in downtown Denver. And if you were trying to get, you know, six or seven blocks away, I mean, taxi cabs were a nightmare. Um, and if you needed to be someplace in 15 or 20 minutes for a meeting and you didn't have an hour to walk, it was the right way to go. Do you think the delegates could have taken home some lessons from that? Well, I think so. I mean, I certainly did and have, um, you know, gotten more involved in following the work of the Washington Area Bicycle Association and in doing whatever I can to champion uh, bike legislation. I'm introducing uh, a bill this session to require motorists to give uh, a three feet distance uh, between the car and the bicycle if they're passing a bicyclist on the road. Uh, we want to make it as safe as possible for the bicyclist, and we want to make the roads as friendly as possible for people on bikes because obviously uh, it's environmentally the right way to go, and um, it you know helps in terms of so many of our different priorities. Now what's, what's the role of the state legislature in improving things for pedestrians and bicyclists, and, and, and what's up to the governor and his staff to do? Well, in the legislature, we would set the basic laws governing the highways and the other state roads and state parks and so on. Um, and, um, you know, the governor would have uh, the power administratively to uh, promulgate rules and regulations that make it easier and better. So I think we both have a role to play. Um, I think a lot of my colleagues... Um, have been getting their consciousness raised recently about the importance of increasing the number of people who use bikes to commute, increasing the number of people who use bikes um, for, uh, you know, running errands. And, um, you know, every person who gets out of the car and gets on a bike is uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, reducing global warming, um, and uh, making the streets safer and, um, you know, liberating us that little bit much more from dependence on foreign oil and so on. So bikes are very much part of the solution here. And, uh, you know, I was just thrilled that um, in Denver there was such a vivid and dramatic display of how crucial bikes can be. Visit us on the Internet at www.pedestrians.org. Thank you.